Good evening and welcome to the premiere of the third season of The Legacy of Queens for Sunday, September 4th, 2022. Hope you're having a great night and a great Labor Day weekend. And thank you again for joining us for a new season. Tonight we're talking about an American radio and television personality, television producer and film actor, and a cultural icon who remains best known for hosting American Bandstand from 1956 to 1989, five incarnations of the Pyramid Game Show from 1973 to 88, and his New Year's Rockin' Eve show, named after him, which transmitted New Year's Eve celebrations in New York City's Times Square. Well, I think I just gave away who we're talking about. That's right. Richard Wagstaff Clark, otherwise known as Dick Clark. He is our man of the hour, or our legacy of Queens, tonight on this edition of the Legacy of Queens. And welcome to the new season of The Legacy of Queens. I'm your host, Jason DiCanio, for Sunday, September 4, 2022, on this Labor Day edition. And we hope that you are having a safe Labor Day weekend. And we welcome you back to the third season of our great show that looks at the people who have made Queens, or in this case, New York, the talk of the town. And tonight we're talking about the man who made New Year's Rockin' Eve a legacy even after his passing in 2012. He still has his name on that show even though Ryan Seacrest hosted it. We're going to be looking at Richard Wagstaff Clark, otherwise known as Dick Clark. Well, Clark was born in Bronxville, New York and raised in neighboring Mount Vernon, the second child of Richard Augustus Clark and Julia Fuller Clark, nee Bernard. His only sibling, elder brother Bradley, a war World War II P-47 Thunderbolt pilot, was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Clark attended A.B. Davis High School, later renamed A.B. Davis Middle School in Mount Vernon, where he was an average student. At the age of 10, he decided to pursue a career in radio. In pursuit of that goal, he attended Syracuse University, graduating in 1951 with a degree in advertising and a minor in radio. And while at Syracuse, he was a member of Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity, or Phi Gamma. 1945, Clark began his career working in the mailroom at WRUN, an AM radio station in Utica, New York, that was owned by his uncle and managed by his father. Almost immediately, he was asked to fill in for the vacationing weatherman, and within a few months, he was announcing station breaks. And while attending Syracuse, Clark worked at WOLF-AM, then a country music station. And after graduation, he returned to WRUN for a short time where he went by the name Dick Clay. After that, Clark got a job at the television station WKTV in Utica, his first television hosting job was on Cactus Dick and the Santa Fe Riders, a country music program. And he later replaced Robert Earl, who later hosted the GE College Bowl as a newscaster. Now, in addition to his announcing duties on radio and television, Clark owned several radio stations. From 1964 to 78, he owned KPRO, now KFOO in Riverside, California, under the name Progress Broadcasting. In 67, he purchased KGUD AM-FM, now KTMS and KTYD, respectively, in Santa Barbara, California. Then in 1952, Clark moved to Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, a sur suburb of Philadelphia, where he took a job as a disc jockey at radio station WFIL, adopting the Dick Clark handle. WFIL 
had an affiliated television station, now WPVI, with the same call sign, which began broadcasting a show called Bob Horn's Bandstand in 1952. Well, Clark was responsible for a similar program on the company's radio station and served as a regular substitute host when Horn went on vacation. Then in 1956, Horn was arrested for drunk driving and was subsequently dismissed. On July 9, 1956, Clark became the show's permanent host. Bandstand was picked up by the ABC television network, renamed American Bandstand, and debuted nationally on August 5, 1957. The show took off due to Clark's natural report with live teenage audience and dancing participants as well as the clean-cut, non-threatening image he projected to television audiences. And as a result, many parents were introduced to rock and roll music. According to Hollywood producer Michael Uslan, he was able to use his unparalleled communication skills to present rock and roll in a way that was palatable to parents. In 1958, The Dick Clark Show was added to ABC's Saturday Night lineup. And by the end of the year, viewership exceeded 20 million and featured artists were virtually guaranteed large sales boosts after appearing. In a surprise television tribute to Clark in 1959 on This Is Your Life, host Ralph Edwards called him America's youngest star maker and estimated the show had an audience of 50 million. Clark moved the show from Philadelphia to Los Angeles in 1964. The move was related to the popularity of new surf groups based in Southern California, including the Beach Boys and Jan and Dean. The show ran daily Monday through Friday until 1963, then weekly on Saturdays until 1988. Bandstand was briefly revived in 1989 with David Hirsch taking over hosting duties. By the time of its cancellation, the show had become the longest-running variety show in TV history. Then in the 60s, the show's emphasis changed from merely playing records to including live performers. And during this period, many of the leading rock groups of the 60s had their first exposure to nationwide audiences. A few of the many artists introduced were Ike and Tina Turner, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, the Beach Boys, Stevie Wonder, Prince, Simon and Garfunkel, Jerry Lee Lewis, Buddy Holly, Bobby Fuller, Johnny Cash, Sam Cooke, Fats Domino, and Chubby Checker. During an interview with Clark by Henry Shipper of Rolling Stone magazine in 1990, it was noted that over two-thirds of the people who've been initiated into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had their television debuts on American Bandstand, and the rest of them probably debuted on other shows they produced. During the show's lifetime, it featured over one, over 10,000 live performances, many by artists who were, not, who were unable to appear anywhere else on TV, as the variety shows during much of this period were anti-rock, Shipper points out that Clark's performers were shocking to general audiences. The music establishment and the adults in general really hated rock and roll. Politicians, ministers, older songwriters and musicians foamed at the mouth. Frank Sinatra reportedly called Elvis Presley a rancid-smelling aphrodisiac. Clark was therefore considered to have a negative influence on youth and was well aware of that impression held by most adults. It was roundly criticized for being in and around rock and roll music at its inception. It was the devil's music. It would make your teeth fall out and your hair turn blue, whatever the hell. You got through that. Then in 2002, many of the groups he introduced appeared at the 50th anniversary special to celebrate American Bandstand. Clark noted during the special that American Bandstand was listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the longest-running variety TV show in TV history. And in 2010, American Bandstand and Clark himself were honored at the Daytime Emmy Awards. Hank Ballard Ballard wrote, who wrote The Twist, described Clark's popularity during the early years of American Bandstand. The man was big. He was the biggest thing in America at the time. He was bigger than the president. As a result of Clark's work on Bandstand, journalist Ann Oldenburg states, He deserves credit for doing something bigger than just putting on a show. Los Angeles Times writer Jeff Boucher goes further, stating that, With the exception of Elvis Presley, Clark was considered by many to be the person most responsible for the bonfire spread of rock and roll across the country in the late 1950s, making Clark a household name. 
He became a primary force in legitimizing rock and roll, adds Uslan. Clark, however, simplified his contribution. I play the records, the kids danced, and America watched. Shortly after taking over, Clark also ended the show's all-white policy by featuring black artists such as Chuck Berry. In time, blacks and whites performed on the same stage and studio seating was desegregated. By beginning in 1959 and continuing into the mid-60s, Clark produced and hosted the Caravan of Stars, which was a series of concert tours built upon the success of American Bandstand, which by 1959 had a national audience of 20 million. However, Clark was an unable to have the Beatles appear when they came to America. The reason for Clark's impact on pop culture was partly explained by Paul Anka, a singer who appeared on the show early in his career. This was a time when there was no youth culture he created it. At the impact of the show on people was enormous. In 1990, a few years after the show had been off the air, Clark considered his personal contribution to the music he helped introduce. My talent is bringing out the best in other talent. Organizing people to showcase them and being able to survive the ordeal. And I hope someday that somebody will say that in the beginning stages of the birth of the music of the 50s, though I didn't contribute in terms of creativity, I helped keep it alive. Then in the 60s, in 1960s, the United States Senate investigated payola, the practice of music producing companies paying broadcasting companies to favor their product. As a result, Clark's personal investments in music publishing and recording companies were considered a conflict of interest, and he sold his shares in those companies. When asked about some of the causes for the hearings, Clark speculated about some of the contributing factors not mentioned by the press. Politicians did their damnedest to respond to the pressures they were getting from parents and publishing companies and people who were being driven out of business by rock. It hit a responsive chord with the electorate, the older people. They full-out hated the music, but it stayed alive. It could have been nipped in the bud by cause they could have stopped it from being on television and radio. Beginning in late 63, Clark branched out into hosting game shows, presiding over The Object Is. The show was canceled in 1964 and replaced by Missing Links, which had moved from NBC. Clark took over as host, replacing Ed McMahon. Clark became the first host of the $10,000 Pyramid, which premiered on CBS March 26, 1973. The show, a word association game created and produced by daytime television producer Bob Stewart, moved to ABC in 1974, and over the coming years, the top prize changed several times, and with it, the name of the show and several primetime spinoffs were created. As the program moved back to CBS in September of 82, Clark continued to host the daytime version through most of its history, winning three Emmys for Best Game Show Host. In total, Pyramid won nine Emmy Awards for Best Game Show during his run, a mark that is eclipsed only by the 12 won by the syndicated version of Jeopardy. Clark's final Pyramid hosting gig, the $100,000 Pyramid, ended in 1988. Clark subsequently returned to Pyramid as a guest in later incarnations, during the premiere of the John Davidson version in 91, Clark sent a pre-recorded message wishing Davidson well in hosting the show. Then in 2002, Clark played as a celebrity guest for three days on the Donny Osmond version. Earlier, he was also a guest during the, Pil the Bill Cohen version of the $25,000 Pyramid, which aired simultaneously with Clark's daytime version of the show. Entertainment Weekly credited Clark's quietly commanding presence as a major factor in the game show's success. Clark hosted the syndicated television game show The Challengers during its only season from 90 to 91. The Challengers was a co-production between the production companies of Dick Clark and Ron Greenberg. During that 90-91 season, Clark and Greenberg also co-produced a revival of Let's Make a Deal for NBC with Bob Hilton as the host. Hilton was later replaced by original host Monty Hall. Clark later hosted Scattergories on NBC in 1993 and the Family Channel's version of It Takes Two in 1997. In 1999, along with Bob Bowden, he was one of the executive producers of Fox's TV game show Greed, which ran from November 5, 1999 to July 14, 2000, and was hosted by Chuck Woolery. 
At the same time, Clark also hosted the Stone Stanley created Winning Lines, which ran for six weeks on CBS from January 8th through February 12th of 2000. Then in 1972, Dick Clark first produced New Year's Rockin' Eve, a New Year's Eve music special for NBC, which included coverage of the ball drop festivities in New York City. Clark aimed to challenge the dominance of Guy Lombardo's New Year's specials on CBS, as he believed its big band music skewed too old. After two years on NBC and being hosted by Three Dog Night and George Carl Carlin, respectively, the program moved to ABC and Clark assumed hosting duties. Following Lombardo's death in 1977, Rockin' Eve experienced a surge in popularity and later became the most watched annual event, New Year's Eve broadcast. Clark also served as a special correspondent for ABC News' ABC 2000 broadcast covering the arrival of 2000. Following his stroke, which prevented him from appearing at all on the 0405 edition, Clark returned to make brief appearances on the 0506 edition while ceding the majority of hosting duties to Ryan Seacrest. Reaction to Clark's appearance was mixed, and while some TV critics, including Tom Shales of the Washington Post, in an interview with the CBS radio network, felt that he was not in good enough shape to do the broadcast. Stroke survivors and many of Clark's fans praised him for being a role model for people dealing with post-stroke recovery. Seacrest remained host and an executive producer of the special, taking over full duties after Clark's death. But well, Clark's first love was radio, and in 1963, he began hosting a radio program called The Dick Clark Radio Show. It was produced by Mars Broadcasting of Stanford. Despite Clark's enormous popularity on American Bandstand, the show was only picked up by a few dozen stations and lasted less than a year. March 25th of 1972, Clark hosted American Top 40, filling in for Casey Kasem. In 1981, he created the Dick Clark National Music Survey for the Mutual Broadcasting System. The program counted down the top 30 contemporary hits of the week in direct competition with American Top 40. Clark left Mutual in October of 85, and Bill St. James, and later Charlie Tuna, took over the National Music Survey. Clark's United Stations purchased RKO Radio Network in 1985, and when Clark left Mutual... He began hosting USRN's Countdown America, which continued until 1995. In 1982, Clark launched his own radio syndication group with partners Nick Verbitsky and Ed Salomon called the United Stations Radio Network. That company later merged with the Transtar Network to become Unistar. And in 1994, Unistar was sold to Westwood One Radio. The following year, Clark and Verbitsky started over with a new version of the USRN, bringing into the fold Dick Clark's Rock and Roll, Rock, Roll, and Remember, written and produced by Pam Miller, who also came up with the line used in the show and later around the world, the soundtrack of our lives. And a new countdown show, the U.S. Music Survey, produced by Jim Zoller. Clark served as its host until his 2004 stroke, United Stations Radio Networks continues in operation as of 2020. Dick Clark's longest-running radio show began on February 14, 1982. Dick Clark's Rock, Roll, and Remember was a four-hour oldies show named after Clark's 1976 autobiography. The first year, it was hosted by veteran Los Angeles disc jockey Gene Weed. Then in 1983, voiceover talent Mark Elliott co-hosted with Dick Clark. And by 85, Clark hosted the entire show. Pam Miller wrote the program, and Frank, Frank Farino served as producer. Each week, Clark profiled a different artist from the rock and roll era and counted down the top four songs that week from a certain year in the 50s, 60s, or early 1970s. The show ended production when Clark suffered his 2004 stroke. Reruns from the 95 to 2004 era continued to air in syndication until USRN withdrew the show in 2020. At the peak of his American Bandstand fame, Clark also hosted a 30-minute night Saturday night program called The Dick Clark Show, a.k.a. The Dick Clark Saturday Night Beach Nut Show. It aired from February 15, 1958 until September 10, 1960 on ABC. And it was broadcast live from the Little Theater in New York City and was sponsored by Beach Nut Gum. It featured the rock and roll stars of the day lip-syncing their hits just as on American Bandstand. However, unlike the afternoon Bandstand program, 
which focused on the dance floor with the teenage audience demonstrating the latest dance steps. The audience of the Dick Clark show sat in a traditional theater setting. While some of the musical numbers were presented simply, others were major production numbers. The high point of the show was Clark's unveiling with great fanfare at the end of each program of the top 10 records of the previous week. This ritual became so embedded in American culture that it was imitated in many media and contexts, which in turn were satirized nightly by David Letterman on his own top 10 list. From September 27th to December 20th of 1959, Clark hosted a 30-minute weekly talent variety series entitled Dick Clark's World of Talent at 10.30 p.m. Sundays on ABC. A variation of producer Irving Mansfeld's, Mansfield's earlier CBS series, This is Show Business from 49 to 56. It featured three celebrity panelists, including comedian Jackie Leonard, judging and offering advice to amateur and semi-professional performers. And while this show was not a success during its nearly three-month duration, Clark was one of the few personalities in television history on the air nationwide seven days a week. One of Clark's best-known guest appearances was in the final episode, The Case of the Final Fade-Out, the original Perry Mason TV series in which Clark was revealed to be the killer of both murder victims in that episode. An ego maniacal actor during the production of a television show and later the producer of that same film television show in order to cover up the first murder. He appeared as a drag racing strip owner in a 1973 episode of the procedural drama series Adam 12. Clark's most humorous appearance was on an episode, Testimony of Evil, of Police Squad, in which he asks an informant about SKA and borrows his skin cream to keep himself looking young, a parody of the fact that Clark was known for his perennial youthful appearance. Clark attempted to branch into the realm of soul music with the series Soul Unlimited in 73. The series hosted by Buster Jones was a more risque and controversial imitator of the popular series Soul Train and alternated in the bandstand time slot. The series lasted for only a few episodes. And despite a feud between Clark and Soul Train creator and host Don Cornelius, the two men later co collaborated on several specials featuring black artists. Clark hosted the short-lived Dick Clark's Live Wednesday in 1978 for NBC. In 1980, Clark served as host of the short-lived series The Big Show, an unsuccessful attempt by NBC to revive the variety show format of the 50s and 60s. Then in 84, Clark produced and hosted the NBC series TV's Bloopers and Practical Jokes with co-host Ed McMahon. Clark and McMahon were longtime Philadelphia acquaintances. And McMahon praised Clark for, his, for first bringing him together with future TV partner Johnny Carson when all three worked at ABC in the late 1950s. The Bloopers franchise stemmed from the Clark-hosted and produced NBC Blooper specials of the early 80s, inspired by the books, record albums, and appearances of Kermit Schaefer, a radio and TV producer who first popularized outtakes of broadcasts. For a period of several years in the 1980s, Clark simultaneously hosted regular programs on all three major American television networks, ABC with Bandstand, CBS with Pyramid, and NBC with the Bloopers. Then in July of 85, Clark hosted the, Amer the ABC primetime portion of the historic Live Aid concert, which was an all-star concert designed by Bob Geldof to end world hunger. And during the 88 Writers Guild of America strike, Clark, as host and producer, filled in a void on CBS's fall schedule with Live Dick Clark Presents. Clark also hosted various pageants from 1988 to 93 on CBS. He did a brief stint as announcer on The John Stewart Show in 1995. Two years later, he hosted the Pennsylvania Lottery 25th Anniversary Game Show Special with then Miss Pennsylvania Gigi Gordon for Jonathan Goodson Productions. He also created and hosted two Fox television specials in 2000 called Challenge of the Child Geniuses, the last game show he hosted. From 2001 to 2003, Clark was a co-host of The Other Half with Mario Lopez, Danny Bonaducci, and Dorian Gregory, a syndicated daytime talk show intended to be the male equivalent of The View. Clark also produced the television series American Dreams about a Philadelphia family in the early 1960s whose daughter is a regular on American Bandstand. 
The series ran from 2002 to 2005. Clark wrote, produced, and starred in the 1968 film Killers 3, a Western drama that served as a promotional vehicle for Bakersfield County musicians Merrill Haggard and Bonnie Owens. He also appears in an interview segment of another 2002 film, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which was based on the unauthorized autobiography of Chuck Barris, and Barris had worked at ABC as the Standards and Practices Executive during a man American Bandstand's run on that network. In the 2002 Dharma and Greg episode, Mission Impossible, Implausible, Greg is the victim of a college prank and he devises an elaborate plan to retaliate, part of which involves his use of a disguise kit. The first disguise chosen is that of Dick Clark. And during a fantasy sequence that portrays the unfolding of the plan, the real Clark plays Greg wearing his disguise. He also made brief cameos in two episodes of The French Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, in one episode, he plays himself at a Philadelphia diner, and in the other, he helps Will Smith's character host bloopers from past episodes of that sitcom. With Ed McMahon, Clark was a pitch man for American Family Sweepstakes until he quit over controversy from the company regarding their sales techniques. Though McMahon briefly continued until the company went out of business, Clark's previous issues managing to escape the payola scandal motivated him to be very sensitive about his public image. Clark was noteworthy for giving an award to Cindy Lauper in WWF's The War to Settle the Score, an event that appeared MTV with Hulk Hogan, Lou Albano, and Roddy Piper. Piper appeared to disagree with Lauper, Lauper's award, assaulted Albino, and Lauper appeared to get caught up in it trying to defend Albano, a real-life personal friend. Fortunately, Clark, Clark had left the ring at that point. Then in 1965, Clark branched out from hosting, producing Where the Action Is, an afternoon television program shot at different locations every week featuring house band Paul Revere and the Raiders. In 1973, Clark began producing the highly successful American Music Awards. In 87, Dick Clark Productions went public. Clark remained active in television and movie production into the 90s. And he had a stake in a chain of musical-themed restaurants licensed under the names Dick Clark's American Bandstand Grill, Dick Clark's AB Grill, Dick Clark's Bandstand, Food, Spirits, and Fun, and Dick Clark's AB Diner. And there are currently two airport locations in Newark, New Jersey, and Phoenix, Arizona, one location in the Molly Pitcher Travel Plaza on the New Jersey Turnpike in Cranberry, New Jersey, and one location at Dick Clark's American Bandstand Theater in Branson, Missouri. Until recently, Salt Lake City, Utah had an airport location. Dick Clark's American Bandstand Theater opened in Branson in April of 2006, and nine months later, a new theater and restaurant entitled Dick Clark's American Bandstand Music Complex opened near Dolly Parton's Dollywood Theme Park in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. From 79 to 80, Clark reportedly owned the former Westchester Premier Theater in Greenberg, New York, renaming it the Dick Clark Westchester Theater. Clark was the son of Richard A. Clark, who managed WRUN and radio in Utica, New York. He was married three times. His first marriage was to Barbara Mallory in 1952. The couple had one son, Richard A. Clark, and divorced in 1961. He married Loretta Martin in 1962, and the couple had two children, Dwayne and Cindy, and divorced in 71. His third marriage to Carrie Wigton, who, whom he married in 77, lasted until his death. He also had three grandchildren. During an interview on Larry King Live in April of 2004, Clark revealed that he had type 2 diabetes. His death certificate noted that Clark had coronary artery disease at the time of his death. In December of 2004, the 75-year-old Clark was hospitalized in Los Angeles after suffering what was initially termed a minor stroke. And although he was expected to be fine, it was later announced that Clark would be unable to host his annual New Year's Rockin' Eve broadcast with Regis Philbin filling in for him. Clark returned to the series the following year, but the dysteria that resulted from the stroke rendered him unable to speak clearly for the remainder of his life. Then on April 18, 2012, Clark died from a heart attack at a hospital in Santa Monica, California, aged 82, shortly after ongoing a transurethral resection procedure to treat an enlarged prostate. He was cremated on April 20th, 
and his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean. Following Clark's death, longtime friend and House Rules Committee Chairman David Dreher eulogized Clark on the floor of the U.S. Congress. President Barack Obama praised Clark's career. With American Bandstand, he introduced decades' worth of viewers to the music of our times. He reshaped the television landscape forever as a creative and innovative producer. And of course, for 40 years, we welcomed him into our homes to ring in the new year. Motown founder Barry Gordy and singer Diana Ross spoke of Clark's impact on the recording industry. Dick was always there for me in Motown, even before there was a Motown. He was an entrepreneur, a visionary, and a major force in changing pop culture and ultimately influencing integration. Gordy said he presented Motown and the Supremes on the tour with the Caravan of Stars and on American Bandstand where I got my start, said Diana Ross. And there you have it, friends. The legacy of the late Dick Clark now celebrating 10 years of his anniversary, of his passing, but his con contribution will always be remembered and we will never forget the tiring work that this man did for over 50 plus years. We thank you very much, Richard Wagstaff Clark. Well, as you know, we are back for our third season of the legacy of Queens and of course the legacy of New York on YouTube. And I'd like to say that episode 51 of our great friend and mentor and teacher, Camille Ferraro, got the highest listenership of listens over the summertime as we did that episode on July 11th just a couple of months ago. 95 listens. 45 of those listens in the first two hours of putting up that program. Folks, thank you very much for your continued support of the legacy of Queens and the legacy of New York. Next week on the program, we're going to be looking at the man who made Barney Miller a household name as he went on to bigger and better things after Barney Miller with his Broadway plays and his big band musician and singing of the 1950s. And then he also replaced Sidney Chaplin in the musical Bells Are Ringing. He is an American stage and screen actor, television director, and musician. Next week, we will look at the man from the, Born in the Bronx, Hal Linden, or Harold Lipschitz. Next week on episode 53 of The Legacy of Queens. I'm Jason DiCanio. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great night. And remember, be honest, be real, and keep it simple, stupid. Yes.